One thing I am not is a poet. So if there is any sound of verse in what you hear tonight, you can blame Cypher Winters and Jay Redden and Kelly Nigren and Will Ritchie, all of those poetic voices who haunt the air of this place. And of course, blame the YouTube on which I have run these voices many times. So, have a nice evening. Okay. A queen must know the sword. My lord, I have no need of such. You do. My lord, I don't, she said, and finally. He laughed and laughed again the more she scowled until she felt, for she was not a fool, that he knew something she did not. Explain, she said. His laughter stopped. There is truth in a sword. The song of man, the heart of man. A sword extends his mind and will. The blade is his intention, reaching out to touch in part what stands against and blocks his way. He wields it slyly, minds his feet. He flows and weighs his enemy until there comes a moment when he works his will, a cut with power to preserve by ending that which stands against. You see, when masters work their art and know themselves, they leave behind a legacy of deeds that noble history records. She thinks, considering his rugged jaw and weathered eye, she sees that he believes that art of sword and stance have served him well, delivered all the riches that he knows, the crown indeed his life despite a lifetime's share of blows. She therefore replies gently, letting fingers trace his stolid lips, her voice a whisper, I am no enemy, my king. My ways, though different from yours, are not some barrier to leap, but all the crust and boundary of my living heart. I am no warrior for to pit your will against. You see, I too have riches, skill and spirit, trade and lore, and yet no sword. Can you explain why, lacking stance of blade, I have nevertheless in comfort often lain? You are a queen, he shrugged, and therefore heir to swords that came before. Your fathers bore their steel to shores that burned and shaped them, set against a sea of trials, bitter times that hammered souls and tempered hearts, and cooled their youthful infirm passions deep in quenching baths of blood. Your forebears learned endurance, sight, and wisdom, arts of men, and on those mighty arts are built the life of pleasure you enjoy. She laughed and sang, I am much more than heir to swords that came before. I am a queen of hearts, and plowshares march before my drums. I tend a verdant garden peopled with a loving folk. You see, I would not fight a man, but stand beside him, know his will, and make such path myself that his path draws me toward my goal. For shame, he cried, indignity to subjugate your will. You are a queen, a queen who would never kneel astride a corpse when she might stand beside a friend. He scowled. It is not murder, I espouse my queen. By God, war is disaster for a king. And any battle-hardened soul admits the truth, that violence reaps a bitter fruit, the taste of ash to godly men. I do not urge my love to war, but only that she learned the noble discipline of steel. You see, a blade is truth, cannot be else, for when the point drives home, the real is parted from the false. Illusion falls away, consigned to past, a realm of half-forgotten dreams, of words and paths not taken. In the moment steel meets blood, it divides is from what could be. What good's a vivid moment if its passing only causes sorrow? This I know, a moment lived, if even bitter, matters more than any moment ending short upon a blade. The mortal breath describes the real, and all that follows cease of breath are words and soil and midnight worms. Mortality is painful, true, and that resounding fact endures if met by sickness, point of blade, or poverty, or stillborn babe. My king has bled in battles, sure, in moments proud and seeming real, but by my word, you fool, I swear that I have bled more off than you. Don't laugh, I see the laughter in your eyes, as if the blood you gladly left on battlefields beneath the sun were somehow greater than the blood I've spilled more oft in darkened rooms. And t I dare you to assert that blood spilled proudly tests more harshly or construes a heart more nobly than my silent blood that ceaselessly is stolen by the moon. He nodded, grunted, said, I grant that what you and the moon work out is real as death and bitter steel. 
but different than the blood I choose to ante up when stakes are high, when actions decide fates, when words no longer matter. Those are moments of the greatest truth. The real is often scribed in blood, but no more made of it than poetry made of ink and peacock quills. I say that truth is vast. A subtle whisper spoke in butterflies and peel of iron and roaring sea and tavern song. Alas, he sighed and turned away. Dear queen, how has my gently spoke request that you should learn the sword so morphed into debate of matters oh so consequential? We both believe that hearts are greater for their arts and trials, and that each devoted learning grants a vision through the eyes of he who named the sapphire sky. It was not spurning of your arts and blood that drove me to request, but knowing how important swordplay is to me, and want that my good queen should grow to understand my inner heart. She smiled, reached up to touch his cheek. My sweet, could any art of sword that I might learn unveil what time and trial have made in you? That glass that colors all you see and then choose to believe? Would sword play grant me power to perceive your sheltered, sacred, innered heart? My dear, I warrant that it would. Let us meet halfway, I say. That I shall train, as you suggest, to know your world and inner heart, a place composed, I do suppose, of spit and polish, steel and steed, if you consent to know me just the same. His eyebrows arched. My queen, I fear what you suggest. You should, wise king. I think you know that knowing me would ask far more of you than merely studying the blade. What arts do you suggest? She laughed. For starters, you might grow a child and give it life between your thighs and nurse it at your breast and cry when at long less the child decides to learn the sword. <laughs> I take your point, dear queen, and see that your view is yet as far from me as stars are from the earth and sand. Perhaps you're right, and lacking any miracle between my thighs, I cannot see through women's eyes, nor can you see through mine. There are respects in which we can find common ground, she said, and leaning in to kiss him gently first, then urged on by his tender, eager lips, more boldly kissed, as nectar of shelled breath they felt, all swords and blood and babes forgot in one true moment, real as death. He wrapped strong arms around her corset ribs, and she let gentle fingers trace his steely breast. He said, shall we retire to speak again when blue jays call the dawn? Damn the dawn, and let your kingdom by today. I feel your people could persist an hour or ten while I and my beloved lay aside our noble veils. <laughs> the grinning king drew close as queen, then turned to lead her from the room, he said. You know, I think you're right. 